So this is the first in our latest series of free exchange events. Um, this series is part of the Outdoor Institute of Art, which is an alternative art school conceived by Yasmin Kanvin, with a curriculum which consists of discussion skills, knowledge sharing events between artists, experts in the relevant fields, the arts sector and members of the public. We've covered all of that here. So for Art and Energy, which is tonight's theme, our speakers are Paul Drury, um, he was an engineer who left a 20 year career in the manufacturing industry in 2017 to study for an MSc in, in Energy and Sustainable Development at Devonport University. His current research involves energy efficiency of buildings, evaluating the potential for very low energy building standards for social housing and addressing the necessity of accessible, secure, reliable and sustainable energy. He's also been offered a scholarship to study for a PhD in Energy Demand Studies at Loughborough University. And Ellie Harrison, who is an artist and an activist based in Glasgow. In 2010, she became the first individual artist to publish an environmental policy. After breaching its transportation section on several occasions, in 2016, she refused to travel in any vehicle for a whole year as part of her controversial, we took out the inverted commas, <laughs> controversial project, The Glasgow Effect. Um, since 2015, she's been developing the Radical Renewable Art and Activism Fund, a new and autonomous funding scheme for radical art and activism powered by renewable energy. Um, as I was saying earlier, we like a free exchange events to take place in a relevant location. Um, so at Top Lodge, um, this building has been fitted on the cafe as well, um, with two different types of solar panels which produce electricity from the sun. Um, the electricity produced aims to reduce the call on the national grid by about 50%. Um, I don't know if you saw on the way in, there's a panel on the wall which tells you how much electricity is being produced right now and how much has been produced since, since they were switched on. Um, there's also a wood heating system here that heats the site, avoiding the need to burn fossil fuels such as oil or gas, and a reed bed sewage treatment system that is used for human waste. Um, harvest, harvest rainwater to flush the toilet. Um, I might come back to you later, Barry, on that, whether, whether that affects you at all. Um, so now I've introduced both of you, um, it's your chance to correct me and do a much better introduction. <laughs> so, can we start with you? Paul? Sure, yeah. Uh, thanks, James, and let me hold bear with me tonight. It's a bit outside my comfort zone, but I hope to just give you a few interesting uh, facts about energy and my relationship to it through my research and some of my uh, experience from the course so far. Um, so yeah, as James said, I, I'm a mechanical engineer. I did my first degree at Nottingham way back in 1991, just from having an interest in all things engineering and having a belief in how engineering can solve big problems and, and make the world a better place. And I went away and worked in manufacturing, principally dealing with efficiencies, trying to get more from less, which is basically what efficiency can be described as. And um, over the last five years probably, just, just a growing awareness of some of the big challenges we have globally from climate change and the way that resource shortages um, potentially in fuels are going to mount up in the future, uh, the effects on biodiversity, the reports that come out by the WWF just emphasising the point how much the environment is impacted by our actions and the way that we generate energy, the way that we live in the modern world, especially in developed nations like the UK, is having significant impacts. So kind of from that I was kind of looking at how I could help as an engineer, what sort of things could engineering offer uh, as solutions to some of these big issues. Um, so I was kind of looking around for uh, master's courses in renewable energy, um, in sustainable design, so 
how we could generate electricity cleaner, or how we could manage our use of resources in a better way, so we're kind of not using um, new product, yeah, new materials. Um, I found a good course at, at De Montfort University, and it was called Energy and Sustainable Development. And I was kind of thinking, where's the link? You know, what is the linkage here? How can we bring these two together? So off I went, kind of joined um, September last year, uh, and learned so much this year just around what the big issues are and how, on a global scale, but also on a local and personal scale, we can solve some of these big, big problems. Um, just a description about sustainable development, just to um, kind of get a marker as to what it might mean. There's the classic Brundtland definition, which was um, written down at the Rio Climate Talks in 1992. And uh, basically, sustainable development meets the needs of the present generation without affecting the future generations' ability to meet their needs. So we can see what we're doing now has an impact on people that are going to be after us. So the decisions we make as to how we consume, how we travel, how we generate energy, um, all impacts everybody else. I think I'll just hand around an interesting graph. It wouldn't be an engineer's talk without a good graph. <laughs> <laughs> so don't be scared if, it, if you don't want to look at the graph. Pass that around. So you kind of, kind of see this graph shows global energy use when it, when it comes around so you can see it from 1800 to the present day which is 2015 and um, it's clear from the graph that we have an insatiable appetite for energy globally so it kind of sums up how things are at the moment and how we consume energy in pretty much all aspects of our lives, from our buildings, um, to our transport, to the materials we consume, especially plastics, is very relevant at the moment. So we can really sort of frame the climate problem of global warming as an energy problem. How we generate electricity how we consume the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. Um, thinking about this sort of um, global issue, as we can see on the graph, that things are not equitable throughout the world. The developed world consumes far in excess of its fair share of energy. In fact, taking the USA as a good example, um, they consume 25% of the world's energy with only 4% of the population. Whereas, on the other hand, uh, globally 1.5 billion people don't have access to electricity. For another 4 billion rely on solid fuel for cooking in their homes, so things like wood, animal dung in some cases, and all this leads to um, poor internal air quality, serious impacts on health. So you can see um, the relationship we have with energy in the West, and uh, the addiction we have specifically to burning fossil fuels has an impact far away from, from our shores. So it's vital for the, for the world we know, um, but we know that some of the, some of the side effects of, of this are rising greenhouse gases, uh, specifically carbon dioxide and methane. Um, I don't know if you're aware that this last week, uh, recent studies on the actual concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's the highest it's ever been in 800,000 years and unlikely to go down in all our lifetimes. So it's now above 400 parts per million, which 
it doesn't mean much in terms of um, numbers, um, but if we continue on this trajectory, then global warming could hit six degrees hotter than now by 2100, which will have catastrophic effects on large sectors of, of the world. So what can we do? What could, what, what, ask the question that I'm asking, what, what can we do? Um, it's possible with energy to think of it in two sides. We can think of the supply of energy and we can think of the demand for energy. The sexy things like renewables and solar and wind are on the supply side. The boring things are on the demand side. So reduction, we can um, concentrate on our houses and our buildings to make them better insulated. We can change the way we travel around by designing cities to encourage walking and cycling. Um, we can look at the things we use, the materials, and keep them in closed loops. So um, we're not constantly using virgin materials, and that's called a circular economy, and reducing demand for energy and resources. Um, but the thing I'm specifically interested in myself is, uh, is energy in buildings. Um, we're all familiar with our own house and how we uh, interact with energy from electric or heating. These are the things that we think about when we think about energy. We don't necessarily think about uh, the abstract concept of energy. We're thinking about lighting, the services that energy brings. Um, or warmth in the case of heating. So everything that we do in buildings has an impact on, this, on energy demand. Um, British houses are typically the worst in Europe in terms of energy performance. Um, we have millions of solid wall buildings built from brick, typically um, Victorian terrace houses, uh, which perform very poorly in terms of the energy they demand to keep the occupants warm basically and that has big impacts outside just purely energy it has impacts on people's health from damp homes it has an impact on fuel poverty we have a great problem with fuel poverty in the UK people just cannot afford to heat their poorly performing homes <coughs> Um, so some, some of the research I'm kind of looking at is how can we build better houses? What, what are the options of building new houses? And what are the options to bring our existing houses and public buildings up to a specification where they, they, need, less, they need less energy? And that makes sense because we reduce the energy demand, then a lot of the other issues about how we can produce energy and we can supply energy is maybe not so important. So one of the um, things I've been researching lately is uh, a building standard called Passive House. And if anybody's familiar with a Passive House standard, and basically it's a, a German code which aims to make houses super insulated and super airtight thus preventing heat loss from the actual fabric of the building. Um, and they aim to reduce an energy demand of a typical house by down to about 10% like a normal average house would. So you can see that could have a significant fact, impact on the energy demanded in the UK but also on a personal level significant benefits for uh, fuel poverty. Uh, I've done a bit of research, uh, social housing, uh, passive house complex in Leicester and they built with a community uh, council they managed to uh, buy some land off Leicester council for a pound and which was a great thing that the council did and uh, built 60 houses to a passive house standard which has taken people who were living in quite poor cold damp houses uh, to houses which are like houses of the future basically and the way that we should be building every house, new house in the UK. So uh, that's kind of where my current research, some of my current research is at the moment. Um, as James said I've kind of offered a scholarship to go to Loughborough University 
to uh, look at energy demand in the built, built environment. So that's continuing this side of the research, so not just looking at the supply, but also looking at the, uh, the energy demand side. Great, thank you. Okay, how you know? okay, Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so I was thinking about what to prepare <laughs> today. And the three themes that were um, mentioned are energy and sustainability. I guess, so I, I'm, I'm an artist and I'm also an activist. I've become more politically engaged, I guess, over the last 10 years. Um, I've been living in Scotland for nearly 10 years. Um, and but for some reason, I decided to bring some quite old work to show you to start off with. And I guess like I'm dealing with a lot of um, the same issues that Paul has outlined in terms of the kind of future that we're heading towards um, with global temperatures predicted to rise at the rate um, that they are predicted to rise at over the next century. And the fact that people don't seem prepared for this alternative future, and that when people think about their careers or they think about their what they're going to do with their life, like um, going to get married, I'm going to get have a kid, I'm going to like get a car so I can drive them to school, like and all of this stuff, and there's there's no there's nowhere in those kind of calculations about our future where we're thinking. Actually, it's a very different world that we're heading towards. Um, you know, if temperatures have gone up by six degrees. The sheer number of, well, people on the move, climate refugees, who are, you know, we, we've already seen a huge influx of refugees over the last um, five years alone. And Naomi Klein has written uh, on that in relation to um, increasing temperatures and like increasing uh, resource scarcity um, but that's only going to get worse and in the UK because we're surrounded by water it's predicted that our temperature will stay slightly lower and it will be a more habitable place and there's going to be even more demand for people to get here so like this idea I just think that there's a complete sort of disjunction <coughs> and that between the way we think about our lives and actually the way the world's changing at quite a dramatic pace. So I guess um, I started to think, when I, got, when I moved to Glasgow, I moved to Glasgow to do a master's in um, fine art at Glasgow School of Art. And I guess when I got there, I thought, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, why am I going to be an artist like, when there's so many more like, pressing problems that, that I should be investing my time and energy in? Um, so, I continued to do... Well, what did I do? So this is... I don't know if I am going to show these. They seem... Show some of them. Okay. <laughs> I need to keep an eye on my... On my um, on my watch as well, so I don't waffle on for too long. I guess like, and I forgot to say as well, that before I moved to Glasgow, when I first met Ross actually, and heard about Fermin Woods, was probably about, well, 15 years ago maybe? Probably 15 years ago, and I used to live in Nottingham. So I lived in Nottingham for eight years before I moved up to Glasgow, and I studied at Nottingham Trent University. And actually, I did do a small project involving a solar panel back in 1999. Um, and I, for my sins, actually begged um, BP for sponsorship <laughs> to get this. I don't want that on the record. But, you know, I, I got hold of the solar panel, but I haven't even brought that work. I brought these works that I made when I was a student that just passed this round. <coughs> I guess I was trying to understand what energy is and how energy kind of perme permeates all aspects of our lives and as humans we need energy to survive in the form of food and we need other forms of energy, you know, kinetic energy, we, well, when we walk, well, we, we transform our chemical energy into kinetic energy when we move and so I was, this piece 
<laughs> was trying to kind of understand like what calories were and how calorific value sort of could be translated in this case into into speed. So I had two little train tracks, one with a carrot on, one with a eclair on, and they were moving at, at speeds relative to their calorific value. So <laughs> it was just a little experiment and a way of kind of illustrating the, va the, the calorific value of, of, of um, foodstuffs that are sort of similar size but very different um, in terms of the energy that they contain. And, and I guess food has been a recurring theme throughout, um, through all the work that I've made. Um, and consumption, and I guess consumption not just of food, but consumption of, of energy more generally. So when I um, I don't know if it's just gonna it's just gonna sidetrack me if I show <laughs> I just have to show these because I think it's more it's a bit more relevant to talk about like what I, I guess what I did when I was studying, which was one to question, you know, why was I doing why had I chosen this career path at this time, it was the time of the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen at the end of 2009, where that was kind of being presented as the last chance that we had to strike some um, sort of global agreement to reduce carbon emissions by the amount necessary to avoid a two degrees um, increase in temperature. Um, so the first thing that I did do was write an environmental policy, which, so I published this in 2009, and it's incredibly tedious. <laughs> it's on my website. You can read it um, if, if, if you're interested. It's kind of written in the same sort of language that a, a business would pu publish an environmental policy. And I guess I was sort of playing with the idea of, you know, why do businesses put this sort of stuff online? It's just generally to kind of improve their um, the greenwashing, I suppose, so that uh, people buy their products, products because they think they've got environmental credentials. So I was playing around with that and actually I did get quite a lot of quick gigs from the fact that I had this environmental policy on life, probably this one as well. Um, but is there's I thought I maybe I'd read the energy section. So there's um, six sections. The first is diet, which is quite interesting because you wouldn't get that in a big business <coughs> um, a big businesses policy because obviously it would be difficult to try and enforce like what all of your employees were eating. You could do that in subtle ways, like nudging them towards eating like slightly more um, less carbon intensive food. Um, but I've got a section on diet and then it goes on to energy, transportation, and then have a section called reduce, reuse, recycle, a section called banking, and a section called continuous improvement. I don't know if I succeed in that. Um, but the energy section goes, since 2004, and I guess if I read this, if you bear with me, it kind of draws out, I guess, the difference between like, individual action and you know, consumer choices, I suppose, that we can make to try and reduce our carbon footprint, and getting into activism to to uh, try to change things on a on a bigger on a bigger level. So yeah, since two thousand and four, Harrison has used one hundred percent renewable energy at her home and at her studio from two thousand and five to two thousand and eight. Currently supplied by Solarplicity. I don't want to really do a plug for a private energy company, but we'll get on to private energy companies in a minute. Um, she also uses energy saving light bulbs at home and attempts to operate best energy saving practice, turning, off, turning appliances off at the plug sockets when not in use and using a cup to measure out the exact amount of hot water necessary to boil for hot drinks. I just can't understand why people don't. I don't know why not everybody doesn't do that. In summer 2013, 
She used the Scottish Government's Green Homes Cashback Scheme to have her loft insulated with mineral wool to the full recommended depth of 270 millimetres and install, install LED light bulbs in the majority of her rooms at home. In October 2013, she set up and launched Power for the People, the sister organisation to bring back British Rail, I've got the t-shirt on today, see the transportation section below, <laughs> <laughs> to campaign for the public ownership of the UK's energy infrastructure and for the removal of the profit motive from all energy production and supply. And she is currently developing her own renewable energy project, the Radical Renewable Art and Activism Fund. So, um, just to elaborate on a few of those things, from the very, very anal <laughs> to the rather <laughs> epic, um, I guess that sort of sums me up. I am a very anal person. <laughs> But I do kind of uh, embark on these very ambitious projects. So I wrote that in 2010 and I update it kind of every year or two, whenever something changes or, yeah. Um, but then I also decided that at that time, a good way of reducing my production of artworks and therefore impact um, on the environment was to channel my energy and time into direct political campaigning instead. So I was looking at a big um, carbon intensive industries, transport, and in Scotland, I don't know if it's the same across the whole of the UK, but it's the biggest carbon emitter out of all the sectors, and energy. Um, and looking at how um, these industries were privatised by Thatcher, you know, I was a child, I was born in 1979, um, buses were deregulated in 1986, the railways were privatised in 1994, um, energy in 1991, and gas, well, that was one of the first, actually, that was 1986. And they did the Tell Sid campaign to try and flog all the shares. Um, and I guess with, with, um, with transport, the reason I became so angry about this was from my own personal experience of trying to travel around in a, a relatively sustainable way on the trains and finding it incredibly expensive and incredibly irritating that there were so many private companies who weren't cooperating at all. And so I launched the Bring Back Rich Rail campaign to popularise the idea of public ownership and to really say that we, in, you know, in order to meet the massive challenge of carbon reduction that we've got ahead, uh, ahead of ourselves, we need public control and accountability over our carbon um, intensive industries and with energy even more so I couldn't understand it was co completely illogical for me that as I say in my, in my policy that whenever you have a profit motive involved um, in the sale or, or distribution or anything, the, 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 the suppliers are going to want to sell more and more and more. That's what capitalism does. And with energy, you want to use less and less and less. And why are we trapped in this model where we can't incentivise people to, to use less? Because even though the energy companies do do that, um, the way that the market's having to be manipula manipulated to kind of enable that is, is so ridiculous that it just doesn't make any sense to, to have people making a profit out of selling, selling us energy. Um, and people should be rewarded for using less energy. And yes, they pay less, but the poorest households have the highest tariffs. So the whole system is kind of back to front, in my view. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time on that. <laughs> and then I have also, as I said in the environmental policy, started to develop my own renewable energy project. And this is kind of in response to, um, well, I'll just, it's called the Radical Renewable Art and Activism Fund. 
and this is our scoping report on page two. It says, um, this, this came out in 2015, I guess I've been developing it since then. Um, public funding for the arts is being cut left, right and centre. Commercial sponsorship requires us to compromise our values and ideas. It's time we had a real alternative. The Radical Renewable Art and Activism Fund will be a new and autonomous funding scheme for radical art and activism powered by renewable energy. So the idea um, for that is, I guess, a response to campaigns like Liberate Tate, like Art Not Oil, who were drawing attention to the fact that big fossil fuel, fuel companies were sponsoring art galleries, exhibitions, theatres, you name it, in order to improve their public um, image. And there was a group called Liberate Tate who campaigned for, I think, five years and did successfully get um, the Tate to end their sponsorship deal with BP. I think it's since been replaced by Hyundai, which I don't think is that much better, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> um, to have a car company sponsoring. But um, the aim of RAF is to think, well, where the money comes from is as important where it, as, as where it goes. And is there any, is there any possibility of like an ethical s source of money? Um, and I guess the problem with BP sponsoring is that that money is coming from um, selling fossil fuels. Uh, if you can get the money from selling renewable energy, then um, does it, is it a more ethical funding source? Is it a more autonomous funding source? And can you then potentially use it to fund more radical and political activity? So I guess that project is kind of working within the privatised energy um, system that we have at the moment and thinking, well, how can we use this to redistribute the wealth in a way that's going to be good and exciting <laughs> and potentially create more social change? Great. Now that's an introduction. Oh, sorry. I knew I was going to ramble because this clock doesn't work. No, exactly. If that clock worked, I'd be all right. <laughs> um, so I thought I've got two provocative statements that I thought I'd share with you. You might have heard one already. Um, so is there a social scientist, architect, town planner called Mayor Hillman, who is a senior fellow and writer at the Policy Studies Institute at the University of Westminster for the past 30 years, and, and he's 86. And he recently claimed, even if the world went zero carbon today, that would not save us because we've gone past the point of no return. Um, another um, provocation, which you might not have heard, was a friend of mine whose opinion I value, and I, I think they said this to me to provoke me, um, that the best way for Woods Contemporary Art to have no impact would be to not exist. Um, unsurprisingly, I don't agree with either statement. Um, <laughs> Personally, I think because we exist, we have the capacity to influence other people. Um, whereas if we didn't exist, we would be doing something else with another footprint somewhere else. Um, and in terms of, is it too late? Um, I thought maybe I could throw this back to you, Paul, about, uh, I think, I don't know about artists um, personally, but engineers, I think, are more optimistic that there's a solution. That's what they do, they look for solutions and solve them. Um, so how do you agree with <laughs> there a solution out there? Um, yeah, well, I think um, some of the issues with climate change engagement is just as human beings, we either sort of discount the risk of it, so we kind of try and put it out of the back of our mind because it's too big a problem to think about, or, or we just kind of struggle to comprehend the slow, long-term changes that are happening because it's happening over a time scale that we're maybe not familiar with engaging with. Um, and I think how it's framed differs from whether it's a purely environmental issue, whether you believe in deep environmentalism where 
the earth has a benefit in itself rather than just an, an enabling environment for humans or whether it's a social justice issue which is something I'm quite interested in is to what we do affecting future generations but also between nations what we decide to do affecting poorer nations um, I think some of the problem is that with business they maybe see it as a more of a risk management issue as to how it's going to impact on their future profits which can sometimes cloud the debate a little bit I think and also um, the financial issue I do know about that article actually in my home we were actually discussing it um, a couple of weeks ago in one of our classes is what's the best way to, to engage people do you seek to scare them or do you seek to offer a compelling vision for what it might look like um, from a technical point of view the technologies that can enable us to have renewable and clean energy is already there so the UK could do it probably within 10 years if if it wanted to there's, there's lots of other factors mostly political and financial issues that kind of stop that happening so technical uh, it's eminently possible um, there's a great thing actually a website called global calculator if anybody wants to look it up when they have a free moment and like to play around with pulling levers on various energy systems in the world and it enables you to look at what would happen if and these are scenarios that engineers and policy makers like to look at so uh, friends of the earth have, have created a scenario which gives us a chance of limiting warming to two degrees and uh, it's a combination of technical and it's a combination of behavioural uh, factors so while he was talking about on our, our own environmental policy around diet diet has a big part to play in addressing some of the issues around carbon emissions specifically moving from a, a very meat rich diet to a vegetarian diet um, I'm doing a behavioural change myself as part of a module we do, um, looking at what you can do on an individual level. So I'm kind of reducing my meat intake. So having a week where I'm kind of eating, uh, having two days where I'm not eating meat, and did some calculations on that. And um, over a course of a year, that will save the carbon emissions equivalent to a return flight from London to New York, which is a significant amount, almost a ton of carbon dioxide saved just from one simple diet change. So uh, we're under no illusions that it's not a purely technical solution and this is why I was quite interested in um, coming today just to understand that the role that art can play or change in values can have around um, how we as individuals, how we can uh, influence governments, policy making to transition to this sort of low carbon economy that we need. I've got another quote for it, it's a bit more optimistic. Um, mm -hmm. Real success can only come if there's a change in our societies and in our economics and in our politics. So it's not much more optimistic. That's actually from David Attenborough, who's 92 today. Um, but I thought it was interesting because in terms of arts influencing change, the, the plastic reduction uh, has largely come about from the Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. and if it wasn't so beautifully made, it wouldn't be as effective. So, um, your question about why be an artist, I think there's something, something in that. Mm -hmm. There's also something that James about um, the messenger of the, of, of the story and David Adam have been you know, a, a trusted messenger of what is actually happening has a big mm -hmm. impact I think as well as the, um, you know, the way that the programme is presented as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean I guess my art work which I didn't focus on quite as much. I don't know if I'm a very pessimistic optimist or a very optimistic <laughs> pessimist. <laughs> I guess I'm quite optimistic. Yes, I'm, I am optimistic, <coughs> otherwise I wouldn't start a campaign called Bring Back Rich Rome. <laughs> Be realistic, demand the impossible. That's one of my favourite slogans from the situationists. So I think that artists do have the ability to sort of think big like that and think yes this is possible and people quite sarcastically ask me how's that going bring back british rail 
And I say when I started in 2009, nobody was talking about public ownership of the railways, and now it's the opposition's policy. So in my view, it's going really well. <laughs> like, and I know that that wouldn't have happened without the campaign. And so activism does really work. And I think maybe like the artists, I in that, A, to be able to ask for these really big, mm -hmm. make these really big demands. And what I, you know, what I could have set about to do was to sort of apply all of the skill, self-promotion skills that I've learned at art school, <laughs> you know. <laughs> My, uh, like, well, not tweeted. Tweeting didn't actually exist when I was at art school, but all of those sorts of things, and think, you know, what what would happen if I just didn't use these to promote my own career, but used it to promote a cause that I feel really passionately about? So, um, yeah, I mean, the campaign has benefited from like five years of six years of arts education like going into it um but I guess I am a bit cynical as well and I think that that's why I've kind of held on to this dual role of an artist and activist and somebody asked me the other day like what's the difference and I kind of mm. felt like the activist kind of did have to provide the solutions in the way that an engineer might, um, but the artist can ask questions. Um, and I think also, maybe the activist has to be the optimist, and the artist can... I mean, I, I think there's, there is a sort of thread of... Of, of, of misanthropy going through quite a lot of my artworks where I do just think humans <laughs> are so ridiculous like and you know a lot of those quotes that are very pessimistic um, and you just think is the self-interest, you know, the greediness, you know, all these aspects that are kind of like inherent in human nature, is that what's going to push us over the cliff? Like, and you can draw attention to, to those things, but, you know, humour is a really important aspect of all of my work. Could you so, talk a bit more about the Glasgow project? Because that, that was not just asking questions, that was actually living a solution. And um, particularly the, uh, the flack you got for it, which I think was just a way of delegitimising the debate, but I thought it was interesting in the same. So could you explain? Because yeah. I don't think anybody knows about that. Well, I did ask for it in a way. <laughs> the, um, so I wrote a funding application. It's a very long story. We've got you, time, don't worry. You're already <laughs> tired. Okay. So I, I, um, I wrote a funding application for this project called Think Global Act Local um, and the reason why I wrote the funding application is because I teach, an, teach at an art school, um, Duncan and Jordan College of Art and Design, Duncan and Jordan Institute College of Art and Design in Dundee and um, they put, well, all the universities require their lecturing staff to, you know, raise money for projects which I don't particularly agree with, but I had to do it. So anyway, I wrote this funding proposal to do this project, Think Global Act Local, and the idea, the basic premise was that I wasn't going to travel outside the city where I live, which is Glasgow, and I moved there in 2008. And then I also decided, because I really, really did, don't like cars, um, that's why I'm such a public transport fanatic. And, like, I would be the one, like, campaigning for the bus route to get put back on <laughs> rather than, like, buying a car or you know, getting into debt through buying a car, which is happening all around the UK. People having to do this because more and more bus routes are getting cut. cut. Anyway, I am. Um, I 
decided that I wasn't going to go in any vehicles at all. I wanted to see if I could do it for a year and just not travel in any vehicle, just go on my bike. Um, and also, you know, I was like living this, what I saw as like this low carbon lifestyle of the future. And like you said, Paul, we need to redesign our cities. We need to make our cities more friendly for cyclists and pedestrians. And Glasgow, since in the post-war period, has been the opposite, has been done to it. Anyone who's been to Glasgow? So it has a massive motorway that goes right through the middle. And what they did when they built the motorway, when they had this vision in the 1940s, the Bruce Report, it was called, was that they were going to smash up all of the tenements that were actually kind of in the city centre, where areas like um, Anderston and, um, well, Gorbals, and like, there was loads of housing within easy walking distance of the city centre. Not to mention there was a hundred miles of tram network. Like, there was, and that was all like publicly owned and properly integrated and with, with the trains and the subway and everything. It was like, you know, it would have been a, the ideal kind of city of the future if they'd have just refurbished existing housing. But what they did instead was smashed up these communities um, and move them miles out of the city centre. So they built four big peripheral housing estates where they moved people to and then they also had a policy of just moving people out of Glasgow altogether. So they set up all these new towns um, around uh, West Central Scot Scotland and they put this huge motorway in and they just thought everyone would just drive. You know, that's the future. Everyone will just drive. So I guess, like, the reason I call my project the Glasgow Effect is because it refers to um, the comparatively low health, um, well, premature health, more, premature mortality um, in Glasgow compared to other post-industrial cities. And the Glasgow Centre for Population Health have done a lot of research into why this happens. And the most recent report, which actually came out in 2016 while I was doing my um, year study, relates it back to all of those changes to the city's infrastructure, to smashing up the communities and the fact that people felt really like they didn't, they didn't feel they had communities anymore and that this had such a terrible impact on mental health that that increased the premature mortality, increased these psychosocial problems of alcohol abuse, violence, drug abuse. Um, so I was trying to join the dots between environmental issues and social issues and you know my vision for a sustainable city is not one where you're, everybody has a car and therefore like they're no longer in poverty because they do measure the um, poverty uh, one of the measures for poverty is car ownership so of course it becomes an aspirational thing because you're going to be branded um, as being in a lower percentage percentile or bit if, if you don't have a car um, but you need one because the public transport's so terrible and you've been moved like miles and miles out of the city centre. So, yeah, I, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to happen to Glasgow and lots of cities in the UK to rebuild these kind of compact, um, sustainable cities. And if you look at the railways on a national level and what happened in the 60s with the Beecham Report, and if you look at a map, of the UK before beaching and after, um, you could pretty much get from any village anywhere in the UK, anywhere else on public transport. And that's what we need to go back to. Like, there's no question about it. And even like people say electric cars are the future, I don't agree with them. Because one thing that I tried to draw attention to when I did my talk, my talk about the Glasgow effect was that cars, um, well, they still create particulate 
like pollution from the brakes and just from the tyres and everything, um, whether they're electric or not. And if they're electric or driverless or whatever, you still get very fat sitting in the back of one or in the front of one. And that's having a massive impact on, on the health service, obesity, uh, diabetes and all the rest of it. So they, it's not the future in my view. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about the criticism you got? Because it makes sense to me that... Um... You, when you sent us your copy, you oh. sort of called it a controversial oh, okay. cluster effect, and um, I thought that was interesting that there was a controversy about something that there was a bit logic sense. Controversy about it because it was kind of misrepre misrepresented in <coughs> the paper that I was an English artist who was being parachuted into Glasgow to do this project and being paid fifteen thousand pounds <coughs> by the Scottish government, which people got annoyed about and um, they didn't appreciate my um, image which I used which was a portion of chips and I mean you shouldn't really ask me about this project because I've already done an hour and a half talk about it and it's just it's just huge you know you can't really sum it up but I think you should have called yourself an engineer <laughs> <laughs> but the the th you know, the reason why I've gone back to these words actually, like this one, which is from 2000, it's called superf Superfluous Consumption. I made this while I was a student at Nottingham Trent University. I don't know if you can see, it's a bowl of crisps here. And the idea of this was similar to the carrot and the eclair, like equating the calorific value in a crisp, like how long could that, in terms of electrical energy power all these appliances in the room and on the TV screen here there's a Dorito <laughs> a giant Dorito it stays on the screen for the length of time that that Dorito could power that TV if it was like electrical energy so like this idea of like food junk food like calories I mean this is this vending machine that I made in 2009 which is reprogrammed to only vend crisps out when the recession or search trends relate to the recession come up in the BBC news feed. So that is like, you know, this work is all about kind of global supply chains and the illusion of consumer society where we think we can get what we want when we want it, but actually, you know, that very individualistic impulse, but that our ability to get the food we need is actually dependent on these huge global systems that are way before, way beyond our control. And one crop failure, two crop failures, you know, when we've got a six degrees increase, we're probably not going to be able to get a packet of crisps out of vending machine, but maybe we will in the UK. They probably won't in other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, the chips were just an extension of my interest in like our role as consumers and the link, making the link between you know what sort of food is available through the free market in our cities in the areas where we live. Um, and 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 health outcomes. Well, it's not pr it's, it's not proven that Glaswegians die of it because they chips. <laughs> but the whole reason I called the project the Glasgow Effect was because I was kind of referring to the Glasgow Miracle, which is the. Um, have people heard that phrase? It's used in the art world to describe like the post-industrial renaissance of Glasgow, how it has um, all of these Turner Prize nominees, you know, it's European Capital of Culture in 1990, and that it has this thriving kind of creative scene, and what I kind of wanted to draw attention to, and what I'm writing about now, because it's like a year and a half later, and I want to sort of condense all these ideas down, because you can see there's a lot of ideas in this project. Um, and 
that the creative industries are really just a sort of sticking plaster and the fact the sheer, vol the sheer quantity of jobs that were lost through deindustrialization is another reason why health um, is so bad, mental health is so bad, um, because um, people don't have jobs and they can't all get jobs in the arts and the, the jobs in the arts and the opportunities in the arts, you know, they, they're people like me, immigrants, who are going there because of the Glasgow miracle and um, making a, you know, you know, being able to access um, being able to access those opportunities that exist in the creative industries. So, yeah, no, that's and the, those 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 two things are so far poles apart. That it, there's not there's no kind of integration. Um, as we've got about ten official minutes left, I think we can probably go over a little bit because we started late. Does anybody have any questions? From the audience? I think coming up from being an artist, I do worry a lot about so back to sort of resources, new materials, etc. we go back to energy, you know, very conscious of the materials I'm using and I haven't managed to break my... I wanted to have an environmental policy and it says on my website coming soon and it's been like that for two years. Um, so I do want to sort myself out and I have to really, but it's just so easy to go and buy some acrylic paints because it's so easy to go and get this and I do worry is there's so many artists who really don't think about that and just waste materials and in just the production of work yeah. uh, and then there's so much energy used in producing work and then that work just sits around and who gets to see it and, and then someone buys it and sits in their house and it, it's just so I do sort of think about that about you know what's art for which we were talking about the energy it takes to use it the materials it takes to use it so I did think would we have a future where you apply to the Arts Council, you talked about public control of, over our industries and Arts Council has some control over the arts, whether you would have some carbon credit yeah. in the offset. I mean, so somebody like Richard Serra, I don't think he needs to make any more huge sculptures, mm. but I mean, the tiny footprint that, and funding that the arts has compared to the rest of the industry, the impact you can have from a, a carrot on a scale electric track, I would say would be worth it. Well the scale electric track, because I was a student when I made that, I went to the toy shop, I bought the two train tracks, I took them to the ESCO, I made the installation, I dusted them, I photographed it, I dusted them down and I returned them. <laughs> 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 no, I, I ate them, but I put the, I returned the train tracks. <laughs> Bit cheeky. Just that I think what you've described is just a version of our general overconsumption. Mm. I could just think through the stuff I bring into my house, you know, because it's more convenient to buy a new thing mm. for the children to do whatever than it is to. Um, so, I, and I think that we do actually have a real crisis of imagination. So, both of you have mentioned the role of that kind of, you can use the words, but that third horizon, who's actually really thinking about creating in the way that you are, Ellie, you know, you, you referred to it as well, something that is radically different and with the sense that we're so trapped, even a lot of activists yeah. are trapped in what I would call second horizon. You know, they're busy trying to make things change but inadvertently mm. are reinforcing current problems actually. So I, I think artists have got a tremendous role. Mm. And yes, and we do need to be very alert to our own personal practices mm. because how are we going to be credible no. if yeah. we're busy telling everybody else that they should green their lives and we're not doing it for ourselves. Mm. I think that's, you know, Gandhi is, you know, we, we need to learn and, and be the change we, we should yeah. see. So. Mm, yeah. okay. Sustainable retreat is the term that James Lovelock describes, so it's too late for sustainable development and development or more is a problem. So how can we adjust and um, if we don't, it's all the things we've described in it. Sustainable mm. retreat. And I've read it so many things recently that have referred to actually sustainable is no longer good enough, it needs to be regenerative. Mm. And then today I was on a call where 
my client was talking about regenerative capitalism, and that's kind of a real alarm bell for me because I'm very much more on the side of regenerative than I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but and yet, you know, actually, how do we engage people who hold the power and resources yeah. to behave in a way that that's yeah, that, that's to me, I was suspicious of, um, and I'm going back to your Casco project again, the, the criticism you got, I think it was a little bit transparent, I think that's, it was challenging power, that's what it was all about, it wasn't really that you were from England and you allegedly had this much money, it was, this, we don't talk about this topic, so I think your, um, your front, that's, that's the value in that. Yeah, yeah, I mean I feel, I mean I felt like that as well. <laughs> you know, and also once once I'd have got taken all of that abuse, like I just carried on yeah. <laughs> with it, you know. And um, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to prove that you could live one year, um, or that you could live like that. But there were all these barriers. I wanted to draw attention to the barriers. One is the money, like, and we need to find ways of making sure that people have the resources to be able to invest time in their communities and take the time to live in more sustainable ways like cooking their own food, not buying everything in a plastic container, like, yeah, I mean my uncle. <laughs> buys a ready meal for every dinner, it's never cooked for dinner, <laughs> like, his whole life. So he just puts it in the microwave every day, like, and that's every day, just the plastic thing going in the bin, and it's... Uh, I think it's just... about the preparation for the future, that's, mm -hmm. um, my like to learn how to cook a meal, shortly yeah. after. Um, I've heard, I, I couldn't find the... Um, Quite unfortunately, but I remember reading an article by another environmentalist um, and scientist, and he'd said basically um, his solution for the future was to teach his son how to use a gun because it might come to that. Um, hopefully, not, but I think perhaps a ready meal might be <laughs> an easier thing to give up. <laughs> well, going back to what Ellie was talking about um, cities, have you got any? The cities of the future, the transport, and the, the yeah, um, type yeah, of things. Yeah, good idea. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the research. We often hear the phrase "smart cities," and I'm never really sure what what it is that they're trying to they're trying to explain. And I think it's really bringing more technology into into the game, and and it's not often really where the solutions lie. I think I know it seems weird talk from an engineer's point of view, but. Um, to be able to create a city which lowers uh, the demand for energy through not just through buildings but through the activities that go on in and around it and that brings in lots of complex issues that, that Ellie was touching on is how people move around the city, how food is brought into the city and there's interesting research where people are trying to grow things on vertical walls so you benefit from green bringing green into the city but you also benefit from growing food close to where it's being consumed so you know you know you're not bringing uh, it's, it's not embedded transport emissions in that food so there's lots of interesting things going on but um, I think it, it kind of just shows the complex interactions amongst everything that we do and how we can kind of link that back to energy we don't often think how it's brought back to a consumption of energy or use of energy and um, if anything, some of the some of the work Ellie uh, is is doing, that making visible uh, something, is, is a good thing because it maybe changes our response to uh, an understanding of what what energy means. Um, I, I, when we were doing about the crisp there, I did actually work out that um, taking the average two thousand five hundred calories that we're all told we should eat um, and figuring out into what we're familiar from our energy bills it works out about two and a half kilowatt hours and we're familiar with seeing that on our electricity bills so yeah. the energy a human consumes in a day is about 30p it's not bad really considering the amount of things we can do for that mm -hmm. um, so anything that makes it visible in people's interactions with with energy and just even just a little thing that makes you think about what are the overall consequences of me 
you know, move, get in my car for a five minute journey to the supermarket to buy some apples come from um, South Africa wrapped in plastic when you can make different decisions around. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we've talked about it's individual, but it's also pushing for policy change and um, engineers to change the way that they actually go about building cities and building, making buildings liv livable. Could I ask, are there any cities in the UK which are a bit more progressive in that area, or is it still very sort of... Um, Leicester's quite good. Leicester, um, the, the mayor of Leicester is uh, very key to change how people travel around Leicester, and they're making big, big investments at the moment with um, um, cycle lanes and, and, and sort of consultations with cycling community in Leicester as to how, you know, we, what sort of things will will they be looking for? Um, I was at a talk a couple of weeks ago uh, called. Uh, it's called, called Sustainable Streets or something like that and um, the people from the Leicester City Council were giving some impact on how they would um, approach, you know, allow people to come into the city without using their cars basically mm. and making it, and what are the things that make people want to go on their bikes, it's a safe environment mm. um, and there was one, one point I think that the guy uh, mentioned which kind of stuck with me uh, and he was talking about his son and he was thinking our streets are not suitable for my son to walk safely around. If we have a mindset of making streets safe for a six-year-old, it's going to be safe and enjoyable for everybody to use. So there's a kind of different mindset for, for town planners and engineers to think about how you might do that. Um, so I, I don't know whether Leicester's unique because of the mayoral system. It maybe allows a bit more of a vision to, um, to be taken rather than a... You know, a normal council approach, or whether it's just a personal approach by uh, yeah, yeah. with the right mayor and the right, you know, attitude to um, to want to do it for his city. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, you know, I'm from Leicester, and I know people who, who live yeah. in Leicester, and he's had a lot of criticism. He's tried to the cycle lanes then stop the flow of traffic. Mm. There's also the fact that they've really expanded the the parking per, permits, so it, it, that's gone quite far out of the city, yeah. and that then makes it difficult for people to park for free. Sure. So although his vision is, is right for the future, it impacts it it a lot of competition because they they can't you know they they have taken away from them. Yeah. The rights to do what they've always wanted to do. So it's it's funny how yeah I hear it from friends of those saying oh, it's really difficult mm -hmm. to get around that stuff. It's it's very you know difficult to park. So that transition from one state to another is yeah. kind of another step on yeah. from that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, used to, I, used to, I used to walk from seven miles from Desford where I lived to Leicester Berkeley where I worked. So I often did that. I used to say how far I could get for the bus that I would have got from town, how far I could get and often could get halfway home. But not many people. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's uh, um, making, wanting people to make a behaviour change, you then have to have the constraints that prevent them getting on the bus or walking or cycling. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to consider that, you need to remove those mm -hmm. to then enable them wanting to cycle, wanting to walk, to be, uh, to be easier. And that comes from, you know, forward thinking and design and, uh, and, and engineering in workplaces and live, living spaces all, all linked together. So it's not an easy task, but I think you know, the values that uh, maybe people are kind of wanting to move away from, you know, a, a purely growth uh, economy to one where we may be valuing more well-being and um, enjoyment is, is one that's quite valid, I think. It's much more fun to go on your bike. <laughs> so when it's raining, it's always raining. Like, I mean, this is the problem. You have to get it all waterproofs. <laughs> So thanks everybody for coming um, and for people watching online, thanks for Martin for making that possible. I think it's important because um, I've not had to travel to get here to take part. Yeah, unlike um, me. <laughs> Don't mind tell you how many private train companies I've got <laughs> on my way down the back of the kit. Um, so thanks to Arts Council who funded this evening, uh, thanks to the Forest Commission and Grounds Cafe for hosting us, and Barry for hosting us in his neck of the woods anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so our next Outdoor Institute of Art activities um, are two workshops. One is Wild Learning Parts Unknown with Sarah Gillette, which is on the 26th of May from 4 till 10 p.m. So it's a, a nighttime activity. Uh, I love this description. It's uh, led by artist and writer Sarah Gillette. Parts Unknown brings the stars down into Fermin Woods, allowing participants to discover the mysterious and infinite through shadow and illumination. Our uh, second um, activity is Wild Sharing, which will be printmaking with Claire Morris Wright. Um, where we'll be using forest materials, plants and fruits to make inks with which to make um, experimental prints. And that's the 9th of June, 10 to 5, so we'll need a bit of daylight for that one. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in either the details of the our mailing list, which hopefully you'll all signed up for by now if you weren't already. Mm -hmm. Alright, thank you very much. Thank you.